All right, welcome back. We are here for part two of our light and image lecture. All right, so after the first lecture, perhaps you've explored your camera a little bit, you know a tiny bit more about it, maybe you've practiced taking some pictures with it. Now we're really gonna get into the nitty gritty of your camera, um, specifically DSLR. How is that different from other cameras? What are those specific functions and how does it actually work? So we kind of have a basis of how light waves are existing in the world at all times, bouncing off everything, our eyes are perceiving them, that's how we see light, color, and image. And our cameras, we also know a little bit about how they are perceiving light, filtering that through the lens, and then recording that data on the sensor, and then also kind of extrapolating that data into the SD that is transportable. But now we're going to kind of dive into a little bit more about the camera. How does your camera actually work and function as its own mechanical device? Okay, so oftentimes I get the question, which is how, how is it that when I look through my camera, I'm looking through the viewfinder, which is the small screen that you press your eye up against. I'm looking through that and I'm seeing the image that comes down through the lens. How is that possible? What is happening? And my answer to that is a series of mirrors. So what is happening is that your camera is filtering different light waves in through the lens. The lens is convex, so it's distilling all of those light waves into one stream. That stream is kind of going towards this first set of mirrors. And this mirror actually bounces that light up to the top of the camera. And then there are two other mirrors, so it bounces up and around this way and out towards the viewfinder. So when you're looking at the viewfinder, you actually are looking at a good representation of what the lens is seeing. It's just because it's bouncing through a series of mirrors that you see it from the viewfinder instead of the lens. Now, if you have a camera that does uh, kind of a, a simultaneous screen share of the image that you're seeing from the lens, it's also because it's extrapolating that data. So it's going in through the lens and it's meeting that sensor. That sensor is immediately transferring it into data and transferring it into pixel, which is which it records on the screen. So it's a different distillation of that information but it's still simulation of what the lens is seeing it's just through either mirrors or through data transfer onto a screen so either way you are getting a direct representation of what that lens is recording via light waves from the natural world Okay, so big things when we're talking about cameras. Number one is exposure. So often when we talk about images, we can say they are either underexposed or overexposed. Those are really common terms and hopefully that's vocabulary that you'll become really comfortable with by the end of this course. But what do those mean? What is exposure? So exposure is the length of time the light strikes the film or the digital sensor. So exposure is an equation, essentially. You didn't know you were, you were gonna get math today, did you? You are. Uh, so it's an equation and our eyes do it automatically for us, which is why when you walk from a brightly lit room, maybe outside and it's nighttime, your pupils will expand. Okay, and so that's that's because your pupil is saying, oh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to do this calculation. I am giving the brain the same quality of image 
inside and outside, but the light is totally different. So how do I make that even? How do I make this equation equal the same thing, equal a correct image? And your eyeball does that by either expanding or contracting your pupil. Okay, that's one way that your brain does it just automatically. You're not thinking about it. It's subconscious. Your body just does it. And that is because your body is creating the correct exposure for you to see all the time. Your eyes are so smart. They're very sensitive to light and they will always give your brain the correct exposure or as good as it can. If it's pitch black, you know, there's not that much that your eyes can do, but they're going to try. They're going to expand and get gather as much light as possible to get your brain the best image that it possibly can. If it's way bright, if you have a million stage lights shining in your face, your pupils are going to contract. They're gonna get real, real tiny, and they're still gonna give your brain the best image that it possibly can. Cameras can do this via auto function, or if you're a very clever and advanced photographer, you can do it for yourself via manipulating the exposure. And there's a couple of different ways that we can shift that equation to equal the right exposure, i.e. a good image. That's all that means. So exposure means a good image, essentially. If you're underexposed or overexposed, it means it's not the best image, either because it's too much or too little. That's what that means, okay? So the longer the time, the more light is gathered because instead of our eyes, which are collecting these moving images all the time, our camera is capturing a single image at a time. So we can either set it so that it has a really quick snap of all the light. So if there's plenty of light, we can make it real quick and it snaps and gathers that information. Or if there's not so much light and we're creating one still image, we can let it gather, gather more light for a longer time to get us the correct image. Okay, so that is essentially what exposure is. It's just how do we get a quality image? How do we get enough light but not too much light and exposure is all about light okay this image right here is so this is by another really famous artist last time we talked about Ansel Adams he was actually friends with this gentleman here his name is Alfred Stieglitz and Alfred Stieglitz is another famous American photographer uh, whereas Ansel did a lot of his work in the Southwest, Alfred mostly stayed on the East Coast, but he was married to a woman named Georgia O'Keeffe. You might recognize that name because O'Keeffe is a famous artist in her own right. And she was a painter. She painted a lot of floral images. She painted a lot of still lives, bones and cactus and rocks. Um, I actually lived for a time in Santa Fe, which is also where she lived because she was uh, in, in poor health. So she actually moved to the Southwest, which was pretty common in the early 1900s because it was very dry. So if you had any sort of lung issue, health problems uh, to do with breathing, you would often move to the Southwest because where the East Coast is very humid, it's very cold, it's very wet. The Southwest is very moderate, it's very warm, it's very dry. So it's really good for breathing. So Georgia lived in the Southwest, which is why Alfred came to the Southwest, hung out with Ansel Adams for a while, did some stuff there, but mostly lived in the New York area. This particular image here is a very early image, a couple of things we can note about it. Um, and I won't explain them quite yet, but we can note that there's a, a lot of dots in this image. It's not clear and crisp, it feels sandy. So note that, note that it, feels a little brown tone. It's not completely black and white. Uh, there's a lot of dark in this image. There's nothing but the background that is a really bright, bright white. It's really close cropped. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis. Half of the composition is given to her hands. 
and half to her face. So that's kind of notable and that usually we, we feel like the face is the most important part of an image. In this image here, we're actually giving equal weight to the face and the hands. So that's something to consider. There's a huge contrast difference. The face and coat are all fairly dark versus the background that is light. So I'm just noting all of these things that as a photographer and as a consumer of photography, you'll, you'll really hone into. And these are things just, just to pick out and just to notice. And we won't discuss why they're important or what they mean quite yet, but as you're dissecting these images, just note all of those different things. And also I will say that throughout this course, there is no mandate that you enjoy all these photos. So as these photos come up on your screen, decide, do I like it? Do I not? If I don't, why? Like, what's, what's the issue? Is it the composition? Is it the way it's made? Is it the subject matter? Is it the mood? Is it the tone? What, what is happening here that you dislike? Or alternatively, if you're like, yeah, I think this is an awesome photo. Why? Is it because it seems out of the ordinary? Because it's a unique image composition that we haven't seen? Is it because of the way that this woman is emoting? She, she has an expression and you feel like you can feel something that's going on with her life? Um, what is it that you like or dislike about this image? You don't have to like it, but you have to know why. Okay, and in talking about exposure, I mentioned this math equation, and it actually has a name and a formula. Uh, if you are really good at math, I can give you the formula, but that's not, you're not going to be tested on it. You don't have to know that. But there is actually a formula that you can calculate your own exposure through your camera. It is called the equivalent light exposure. And what that means is it's always going to equal the correct amount of light to create an image. That's what that means. And we can adjust, just like in algebra, we can adjust all of the other components in that equation to always get the same result. And the same result is just enough light to create an image, but not too much that we blow it completely out of the water. Our eyes do that again with our pupil, so it will do that automatically for us. So our brains know the equivalent light exposure calculations, and they then use the muscle in our iris. So our iris is not only beautiful, but it's a muscle, and that contracts or expands our pupil always to create equivalent light exposure. So our brains are constantly doing that for us. It's calculating this algorithm to get equivalent light exposure. With our camera, we have to manually do that. And we can do that by adjusting the following. Aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. If any of those sound foreign to you, don't worry, I will explain them. Okay, but those are the variables by which we can manipulate and create equivalent light exposure, aka a correct image. Okay, number one is aperture. So if you have your camera, remember last time I showed you how to take your lens off. So I'm gonna press this button here, I'm gonna twist it and lift straight up. I'm going to carefully set aside that camera body because it is naked, it is sensitive right now. We need to be very careful with it. I'm gonna take this lens cap off also set that in a safe place. And right now I have just my lens. Take your lens and hold it up to the light. I'm going to see if I can hold it up to this camera. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So you can see through the screen a tiny little hole. As I hold the top and bottom of the lens, I can twist that and the hole gets larger and smaller. So there are little metal plates inside of this lens. And as I'm twisting, all of those little metal plates 
either come together or they separate. And sometimes you, you can get a little bit more of a geometric shape. This one appears pretty round. That's not always the case. It's just different types of lenses. Okay, but twist that and you get that hole bigger and smaller. So think about that in terms of what I just said. If your pupil adjusts to the amount of light that is either in a room or outside, this is essentially your camera's pupil. The aperture, so it either gets bigger or smaller depending on the amount of light that is accessible. Now while your brain does that automatically, you yourself as the photographer are going to have to learn how to do that for your camera. And why do you need to learn how to do that rather than it just being on auto? A, because auto didn't always exist, so you had to learn. And B, because as a photographer artist, you get to decide, is equivalent light exposure actually what I want? Or maybe do I want something different? Okay, instead of the decision being made for you with an auto function, you get to decide that for yourself. Okay, so there are numbers and aperture is annotated in F dash number. Okay, aperture is a little, a little confusing because aperture is actually a fraction. So the smaller the number, the larger the opening. And that always throws people off. So just remember that aperture is backwards. Smaller means a wider opening. Smaller opening, bigger number. If you have kind of a standard to large set of aperture sizes in your camera, it will probably be something like, we call them f-stops. F1.8 to f22 is, it's a pretty wide range, probably 2.8 to 22 is fairly standard. If you have less than that, that's okay. I know some of you do. It should be fine for the purposes of this class, but just so you know, it does typically range from 1.8 to 22, and that's really wide, so you're in a darker environment. You need to gather more light all the way to f22, which is a bright desert day, so much sun reflecting off everything. I need my sunglasses. I need a very small opening. I need not that much light because there's so much already. Aperture controls light coming through a lens by physically blocking some of it. Overlapping metal plates can be controlled to leave a smaller or larger amount of space for the light to pass through, and these are known as f-stops. So mm, photographers might ask you, oh, what was your exposure? And you can say, oh, I was at f4 at 1 100th of a second, which we'll learn in a second. So that will be kind of the indicator of what your exposure is. So that's part of your exposure equation is the f-stop. So that's going to be the first way that we talk about that we can manipulate the amount of light to get to our equivalent exposure value. The next component is the shutter speed. So this can also be talked about in terms of barn doors. So imagine if you have your camera, you have your aperture set, so it's a certain size circle that's letting different amount of light in. When you depress the shutter button, which is the button that you'll press to take a photo, what happens within your camera is that doors will open. Typically, these are barn doors, so they'll open and close. Sometimes they go this way, sometimes they go this way, or occasionally it's a flap attached to a spring, and when you hit that button, it'll be open and then it'll shut close. So you can imagine the longer my barn doors are open, the more light can come through. I say, oh, I need a lot of light. I'm gonna hang out here with my barn doors open. Oh, okay, now it's time to close. Versus, it's a really bright day, open and closed. 
Okay, so that's another way that we can just mediate the amount of light that is being let into our camera. All right, so that's shutter speed. And we talk about that in terms of the shutter being the mechanism that open and closes the door and speed being the amount of time that we let it stay open. It can be a fraction of a second to whole seconds, you know? Um, sometimes in the middle of the night and you have no other light around, maybe you wanna do a 30 second exposure. Maybe your camera even goes up to a minute or it can be one one thousandth of a second. So you have this giant range and that's just another avenue that you can manipulate the amount of light to equal equivalent exposure. Okay, couple examples. So if you have your camera on auto, you don't get to make these decisions, but here are a handful of artists that did make this decision. So I want you to look at this image for a minute and think, what does this image make you feel? What is going on here? Personally, I feel something a little off-putting. This image, so there is a boy clearly in movement. Boy, girl, figure, I'm not sure. A, a human in a white colored shirt is in movement and that is creating a blur effect for me personally. I feel like this is something very ghostly. I feel like this is something a little unnatural. Other people I have talked to in the past feel like this might be something angelic. Maybe it's something uh, spiritual. Right, so it just depends on how you view this image. And again, this is an artist making a clear and distinct choice so that the audience has a reaction. The reactions can be a little bit different. This is Ralph Eugene Meachard, and maybe I know that this is a little bit off putting because I'm familiar with his body of work, which often has to do with uh, children in masks. He really does deep shadow, he really exemplifies the grotesque. So I Perhaps I'm colored by that knowledge as I'm looking at this image so I don't see something angelic. Instead, I see something kind of ghostly, maybe even demonic, you know? Um, but this has been done through a long shutter speed. So what has happened is Ralph, as the photographer, has set this camera up. He's depressed the shutter button and the shutter speed is long enough so that when this figure jumped out of that window, the camera recorded that drop as he dropped a little bit and it recorded all of those moments along the way. So it gives us the result of this very blurry image versus the figure standing at the bottom of the image was static, right? They were not in motion. So it didn't really matter how long those shutters were open, that image was very crisp and clear. The same with the, the building and the background and all the rest of it. So we can see that there's a very intentional use of equivalent light exposure that is perhaps longer than is technically correct. So you could never have completed this image via an auto function. This is manual mode only to create this this very intentional sensation of only the central image in motion. So there are a lot of smart things that happen throughout this photo to create the end effect. Um, additionally, we can see that this image is fairly centrally composed. So our, our main focal point is in the center of the image. Uh, there's a, again, a lot of use of contrast. So we have this figure in the white shirt against a black window. We have this person in a white shirt against a fairly dark wall. So again, really, really using contrast very intentionally here. Uh, we're using a bullseye or central composition. Everything of importance is exactly in the middle of the photo. And it's also a little bit weighted towards the bottom. So that, that feels natural to us as humans because often, you know, gravity says the heavy stuff should be at the bottom. So we do have more information at the bottom of the image than we do at the top. Again, make your own conclusions. Whatever your opinion about is about this image is totally accurate. 
All right, again, same artist, again, toying with this idea of something static versus something moving. Again, utilized with probably a smaller aperture, i.e. an f-stop of between 5.6 and 22, and a probably fairly long shutter speed, i.e. 1 60th of a second or longer. Okay, and I will go back and just mention within shutter speed, if you go ahead and turn on your camera, okay, let's see if I can show this here. Yes, I can. Okay, great. So there should be a series of buttons on your home screen. This one here is indicating my shutter speed. So for me, I can adjust that by toggling this round rotating button here. And you can see as I do it, those numbers change. So yours will probably function very similarly. And I can go, let's see, I can go from 30 to, still going, still going, one four thousandth. So that is the range at which I can manipulate the speed of my shutters. So that is one four thousandth of a second. So that is very, very quick. Let's see what happens when I do that. So you heard, you can also hear when it does that sound, it means pretty fast. And that sound was so fast that I really, I didn't get anything. It was just black. That means it, it was not enough light, that was not enough information to create an image. Now, alternatively, I can go to the other end of this spectrum. There we go. Okay, so that's 30 seconds, which feels like a real long time. Let's see. So you heard one click, which means the shutter's opened. Now I'm just holding this open, holding this open, and it's going to be a minute, and within that, it's going to be a half a minute, within that 30 seconds I will explain that 1 60th of a second is the point at which you can hand hold a photo. So that's going to be fast enough that the motion of your hands don't matter. If it's anything longer than 1 60th, of a second, you will need a tripod. Okay, so you heard that second click, that means my image is done. And I'll let you see what came of that. Pure white. So I went from pure black to pure white. So one four thousandth of a second was not enough light at all to create an image, and 30 seconds was way too much light. So I got only a white image. So that's underexposed, meaning all black, versus overexposed, meaning all white. And there's a spectrum in between. So if you shoot an image that we can clearly see a subject, but it's really washed out and light, we will consider that overexposed. If it's really dark, it's hard to decipher some details, we will call that underexposed. Okay, so that's the difference. Go ahead and explore that. Try that out with your own camera. Create an image that is all black, create an image that is all white. Try it out, see what your camera can do. Again, if your, if your shutter speed is shorter than 1 60th, you can handhold. If it's longer, you'll need a tripod. Okay, so that's the point at which the motion of your hand will actually create blur within the image. So the last factor, there are three ways that we can manipulate the amount of light coming into our camera. The last way is called ISO. Can be film. If it's an old camera, if it's a new camera, i.e. digital, which is what we are working with, uh, it will be the amount of information that your sensor can collect. So sensors have gotten more advanced throughout the years, which is why I say uh, a lot of really quality photography can be done with an iPhone 12 because it has a phenomenally sensitive sensor. It is very sensitive to light. It can collect a lot of information, meaning it has a very high ISO. Alternatively, if we're working old school and we're working with film, you can actually purchase film that has different grains. And the way that film, let me be nerdy for a second, 
The way that film works is that it is a strip of clear sheeting, plastic sheeting, and on top of that we put a certain amount of gelatin, and within that gelatin it holds silver halide crystals, and those are the equivalent of our photosensitive crystals or grains. So it's, it's the same as with our photoreceptive cells in our eyes. So the silver halide is sprinkled in that gelatin, it's kind of encased in that gelatin, uh, attached to this clear plastic. And the amount of halide crystals within that film equals the sensitivity. So if I have just a couple of grains of sensitive crystals, sensitive chemicals, I will get an image, but it'll it'll be pretty grainy. It'll feel like sand, right? And if I have a lot of them, and if they're really fine, then I get a really clear image. So it's sort of like grits of sandpaper. If I have not a whole lot of grit, it's going to be really crusty. It's gonna it's gonna feel rugged. Versus if I have a lot of them, and if they're very small, then it feels pretty soft. Then it feels pretty pretty clear. The same thing happens with our digital sensors. Okay, and you can get real nerdy about the specs of your sensor, but just know that early sensors were not as light sensitive as they are today. We've made a lot of advancements and the amount of information that your sensors can collect per inch has increased. Okay, uh, in chemical days, the film sensitivity was set. So you would purchase a roll of film at a certain ISO. So that was static. You would calculate the rest of your equivalent light exposure to your film. That number was expressed as an ASA number. Today, we borrowed that old system of just annotating that sensitivity setting to our digital cameras, even though those acronyms don't totally make sense, but we've brought them over from the old days, right? So normally point and shoot and cell phone cameras either have no way to alter the ISO, which is another reason why it's tricky to do this course without a DSLR because it's hard to manipulate the ISO, or they do it automatically, which takes the control out of your hands. And as an artist, you want all of the control possible so that you can, you can decide what your image is doing and what it's saying as a result of that. So ISO is something on your camera that you can dictate. So go ahead and grab your camera if you have it ready. Okay, so I have ISO in, in the farthest setting, okay? And I can actually manipulate that by depressing this button right here, which is my ISO button. I can press that and then it brings me to a different screen that just says ISO and I can just, Okay, so I'm depressing that and I can just arrow over these buttons to select my different ISO. Okay, so mine has from 100 to 6400. Here's the note on that. Try them all, see what happens, but 100 is going to be the clearest, most beautiful image, but you'll need a whole lot of light to get there. A whole lot of light versus 6400 which is going to be real grainy it is going to feel and look like sandpaper it is going to just have a real gritty real kind of crunchy quality okay so I will say for any digital photography as a rule, don't go past 1600 or the quality is going to turn into pixel quality and it's going to look real rough. It's going to look like real early video game quality when you had 16 pixels. Like think of early gen Pac-Man. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're thinking about when we convert that ISO into pixels at the end of the day. And people will think that you don't know what you're doing. 
versus film where you could kind of pull off the grainy aesthetic. In digital photography, it's hard to do that. It just looks like you're taking a bad photo. Okay, so don't go higher than 1600 as a rule. If you are in that situation, what do you need to do? Integrate more light. Bring in some artificial lights, bring in a flash, do something. Don't push your eyes up that hard. Okay, alternately, it's going to be pretty tricky to go lower than 400. You could maybe do 200 if you're in the desert in the middle of the day, but also your light's going to be really harsh. It's going to be hard to take a nice photo in those settings anyway. So I would say probably between 400 and 1600 is your happy spot. Within that range, feel free to wiggle around a little bit, adjust to get the equivalent light exposure. But those would be my my rules for the easiest shooting and the best quality. All right, let's talk about artists who have kind of explored this realm. So this one here is Nan Golden. And look at the image quality. What do you feel when you look at this? This is... This is a textured kind of crunchy quality. This has a lot of green. So we're thinking about, it feels, it feels crunchy, it feels rough, but this made sense for Nan Golden because Nan Golden was an artist who worked in typically uh, New York in really rough neighborhoods, uh, New York, New York and Boston, inner city, really rough cultures. So Nan actually inserted herself into drug culture, into uh, a lot of teen crime, into a really, really tough, just a lot of people who, who had really tough upbringings, mental health, drug addiction, homelessness, a lot of real serious, really gritty scenarios. So it made sense that these gritty scenarios also matched the gritty tone of that ISO. So Nan, when she was showing us these really intimate and beautiful portraits of these drug addicts uh, mid shooting up, that this would be depicted in high grain count, right? Like big, chunky, chunky. Um, so you can kind of see that although it's not technically correct, this was an artistic choice that she chose to evoke some emotion into the viewer. Okay, and this this actually is a self-portrait of Nan, but she did many portraits of uh, the friends that she made along the way. So contrast, I'm gonna switch that again. Woo, crunchy, crunchy, to crisp. So this is Annie Leibowitz, who is a contemporary famous photographer. Uh, she does a lot of work for magazines. She does a lot of editorial content. She does a lot of portraits of celebrities and stars. And you can see this is Queen Elizabeth. And this is the sharpest photo. This image we could zoom into and zoom into and zoom into and zoom into and it would still be crystal clear. And this has to do with Annie Leibowitz really taking the studio setting to the max. So there's an enormous amount of studio lighting in this setting. There is a ridiculously expensive camera with an incredibly sensitive sensor and just the capabilities of having the lowest possible ISO to create this really crisp, clear, great quality giant image. And by giant, I mean in pixel count. And it's just so crisp, so clear, almost looks fake. Right? So we're contrasting real crunchy versus really sharp. And that also is an indicator of what is the tone. So Annie Leibowitz is doing portraits of celebrities and stars. So these are larger than life. These are surreal. These are crystal clear. These are people who you could put a magnifying glass at and, and often they do have a magnifying glass pointed at them all the time. 
So it's these high production, very eloquent, very luxury feeling images versus Nan, who does, like maybe she's chilling on a, chilling on a couch with herself um, after having had a tough conversation with any of the people that she photographs. Queen Elizabeth had her breakfast served to her by, you know, Michelin star chefs and has designer clothing. She lives a totally different life and you get that feeling through the photo. So again, these are conversations about what is technically correct in photography and what are you trying to get at? What is your larger goal? How are you pushing your audience to really think and feel in a particular way? All right, so that is the end of that presentation. So we'll go ahead and close it out there. Hopefully at this point, uh, you are starting to get a larger handle on your camera. I will say, take everything that I have told you today, use it on your camera and really explore those settings. Figure out what it can do. If you haven't started using your DSLR within your morning ritual, try that shift. Just explore, see what happens. And that is all that I have for you. So go explore, have fun, create some images.